Hi readers, good morning. Welcome back. Today we're going to continue reading by the Great Horn Spoon. We're going to continue chapter three. So chapter three, part two. <clears throat> Will you turn and tell your talking partner what happened last? Good morning. Yoda wants to do it today. Hi Yoda. So last we were reading by the Great Horn Spoon. What happened was he was Jack was writing a letter to his aunt back home and we thought about what life must be like on the journey to California. You can tell what's gonna happen. <gasps> I forgot. He knows. By the Great Horn Spoon, Chapter Three, Part Two. When Jack looked up at the captain, he was standing on the paddle box. <clears throat> squinting at a distance through his brass long glass. Hmm. Meh, he scowled. She's not this sea raven, mates. It's a different ship. No doubt there's not enough breeze in these winds to blow out a candle. It was almost two hours before the two ships came within hailing distance. Praiseworthy finished his 50 laps around the deck, and Jack locked good luck, the pig, in his pen. But 10 minutes later, the porker was at Jack's heels again. Captain Swing got on his silver speaking tube and shouted across the water. With all her sails hanging like great curtains, the square ship seemed to Jack like some giant on the sea. Ahoy! Ahoy! answered the master of the ship through his silver speaking tube. Ahoy! Da, da, da. Have you seen the sea raven, sir? Aye, Captain. She came steaming by a day ago. Captain Swain lowered the speaking tube from his lips long enough to say, Last, the voice from the other ship fro floated across again. Can you give us a tow, Captain? What's that? I've been claimed for a week. We're 36 days out of New Orleans and bound for California. <gasps> Wait a minute. New Orleans? <gasps> Isn't that what we saw on the California Oakland Museum website from New Orleans to California? <gasps> Readers, so are you telling me this is a, might be the same journey? I can't wait to go back and read that part today. <gasps> At fever broken out below the deck, sir. The sea raven turned her back on us and ran. I beg you, sir, give us a tow until we catch a wind to make port. Will you turn and tell your thought partner, what are they asking the other ship to do? Well, they're asking to, if they could have a tow. So that it sounds like they're stuck and they want to get somewhere, but they can't. And there's fever that broke out below. I know. Okay, ready? To come to the air aid of the other ship could very well mean that the Lady Wilma might be put out of the race. She might never catch up with the sea raven. Captain Swain rubbed his plump nose. He took an eye at the other ship with her canvas hanging from the yards. Then he raised up his speaking tube to his lips and shouted, Go get help! Go get help. I hope they get help. There came a wild shouting from the rails of the other ship where passengers and crew tossed hats in the air. Jack couldn't help being swept up in their joy and relief, and he told himself that the Lady Wilma might yet get back in the race. If Captain Swain didn't think of something, praiseworthy would. Within the hour, the side wheeler was in harness, like a sturdy ox pulling her burden across the equator. The great Southern Cross rose higher in the heavens. Jack's education proceeded without books. 
praiseworthy borrowed Captain Swain's brass long glass at night to study the sky. They examined strange constellations and cloud and clouds. It was a glittering landscape never seen overhead in Boston. Praiseworthy, said Jack. Was my father anything like you? I mean, nothing like me, sir. They were silent for a moment. There were times when Jack felt a great emptiness, a loneliness that not even Aunt Arabella could dispel. Even if they should find no gold in California, he was glad to be traveling with Praiseworthy, to be sharing adventures and even misfortunes. Were you always a butler? He asked. Always. Jack brushed the hair out of his eyes. I mean, yes, always. But if you weren't a butler, you wouldn't have to call me Master Jack, as if we were at home. We're partners. You could call me Jack, plain Jack. Oh, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be proper. No, no, no. But I like it just fine. We mustn't forget my position, Master Jack. But if we strike it rich, you won't have to be a butler anymore. Oh, I shouldn't like to be anything but a butler. Not for one moment. I was born a butler like my father before me and his father before him. It will please me to go on serving your Aunt Arabella. Look there, Master Jack. I believe that this constellation in the stars is a whale. A fine sight, isn't it? The two gold ships, linked together like sausages, went lumbering through the sea. On the fifth day, a puff of wind began to tug at the other ship. And then, one after the other, the top sails, the royals, and the mainsails swelled like great white clouds. By grabs, she's caught a wind. With a general shout, the other ship threw off the tow lines and the two ships parted. There was a final exchange of good wishes. Then Lady Wilma kicked up her paddle wheels, relieved of her burden, and sprinted forward. She was back in the race. We'll stop there for next time. Chapter four, the pig hunt. Hey, readers. So do you remember we, the, in that book that we just read, it said that they came from New Orleans? Well, tune in to your reading assignment because we're going to read more about the real events that happened.